This is the eighth and final video in a series where I cover everything you need to know to build a GPS receiver from scratch. In the previous video, we learned how to decode information from the satellite's navigation message. In this video, we'll learn how to use that information to determine our location. In the very first video of this series, I said that if we knew where a satellite was when it transmitted a signal, and how long that signal took to reach us, we could draw a sphere around the satellite's position and know we were located somewhere on the surface of that sphere. If we express this mathematically, we get what's called the pseudo-range equation. This is the equation we'll eventually solve to determine our location. So let's start with that. First, what coordinate system should we use? If we have some location, say the location of this satellite, how should we describe it? Geodetic coordinates, that is latitude, longitude and height, are probably the most familiar. Here, the latitude is shown as the angle phi, the longitude is shown as the angle lambda, and the height above the surface of the Earth is shown as the length h. However, with these coordinates, it's a little awkward to calculate the distance between two locations, which we'll definitely need to do. What works better are Earth-centred, Earth-fixed coordinates, or EC, EF coordinates. These are Cartesian coordinates where the origin is at the centre of the Earth, the x-axis intersects the equator and the prime meridian, the y-axis intersects the equator and is 90 degrees from the x-axis, the z-axis intersects the North Pole, and each coordinate is measured in metres. Using this coordinate system, Let's say the satellite is located at the coordinates capital X, Y, Z, and it transmits a signal that takes capital T seconds to reach us. The signal moves at the speed of light C, so it travelled a total distance C times T. If we draw a second sphere centred on the satellite with a radius equal to this distance, we know that we must be located somewhere on its surface. Another way of saying this is that the distance between us and the satellite must be equal to the distance the signal travelled. We can express this mathematically. On the left-hand side of this expression, we've used the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the distance between us and the satellite, where we've denoted our unknown location, lowercase x, y, z. On the right-hand side, we have the distance the signal travelled, c times t. Let's subtract this term from both sides, making everything equal to zero. This will make things a little easier for us later. One thing I brushed over is how we actually calculate the transit time, capital T. We know when we received the signal, and the GPS spec tells us how to calculate when it was transmitted, so isn't it just a matter of subtracting one from the other? Well, that assumes that our clock and the satellite's clock are synchronised. Unfortunately, that might not be the case. If our clock is ahead of the satellites, that'll make transit times seem longer. If it's behind, they'll seem shorter. Even if it's a one millisecond difference, that corresponds to a distance of 300 kilometers, in which case our equation definitely won't hold, so we need to account for this. The difference between our clock and the satellites is called our clock bias, which will denote lowercase t. We can update the equation to account for this, like so. This is called the pseudo-range equation, and if we can solve it for lowercase x, y, z, and t, we'll know our location and clock bias. But before we can do that, we need to calculate uppercase x, y, z, and t. In other words, the satellite's location and transit time. But that's a bit ambiguous the satellite's location when, and the transit time of which signal? Well, to be more specific, the signal we're interested in is the PRN code that we received most recently. We want to know where the satellite was when it finished transmitting that PRN code and how long it took to reach us. Let's start with the transit time. Now that the pseudo-range equation is accounting for our clock bias, we really can just subtract the transmission time from the reception time. Section 20.33331 of the GPS spec tells us how to calculate the transmission time. 
We start with an initial estimate, TSV. From this, we subtract a value, delta TSV, that accounts for drift in the satellite's atomic clock and applies relativistic corrections. Because we're only using the L1CA signal, we also need to apply a correction term. All of these equations can be implemented exactly as they're written in the spec. They use parameters from subframes 1 and 2, so we need to wait until we've received those. The only thing the spec doesn't explain is how to calculate that initial estimate, TSV. How do we do that? Well, remember the time of week count parameter that we spoke about in the previous video? If we take it from the previous subframe and multiply it by 6 seconds, we get the time at which the current subframe began transmission. And that's a starting point for our estimate. And remember how the tracking stage counts the number of PRN codes it's observed? If we add one millisecond, which is the duration of a PRN code, for each PRN code we've seen in the current subframe, we get an estimate of when the most recent PRN code finished transmission, which is exactly what we're looking for. That gives us our estimate from which we can calculate the transmission time. It's also important to note that this time is expressed as a number of seconds since the start of the current GPS week. We'll need to make sure that the reception time is expressed in the same way. Compared to the transmission time, calculating the reception time is pretty straightforward. We start by recording the time at which we finished receiving the PRN code, as shown on our clock. From here, we need to express it as a number of seconds since the start of the current GPS week. GPS time doesn't include leap seconds, but computers do. So the next thing we need to do is undo all 18 leap seconds that have occurred since GPS started operating. It's not strictly necessary to do this. If we didn't, the 18 seconds would just be absorbed into the clock bias, but it might make you wonder why your computer's clock is 18 seconds different from the satellites. Next, we calculate the number of seconds that have occurred since GPS started operating. And finally, we calculate the remainder of this value when it's divided by the number of seconds in a GPS week. This tells us how many seconds have passed since the start of the current GPS week. Using this and the transmission time, we can calculate the transit time. The last thing we need to calculate in order to use the pseudo range equation is the satellite's location. This is simply a matter of implementing the equations exactly as they're written in the spec. They look a little intimidating, but you don't actually need to understand them. They use parameters from subframes 1, 2, and 3, so we'll need to wait until we've received those. The only thing I'll note is that the equations include a variable t. They calculate the location of the satellite at this time. As we discussed before, we want to calculate the satellite's location at transmission time, so that's what we should use for this variable. OK, let's revisit the pseudo range equation. We now know the values of capital X, Y, Z, and T, so can we solve this? Well, no. There are four unknowns, but only one equation. What we need is a system of equations. But how would we define such a system? Where are we going to get three other equations? Well, what if we copy the pseudo range equation three more times, each for a different satellite? We know how to calculate the satellite's locations and transit times. Our location will be the same across all four equations. And the satellite's clocks are synchronized with each other, so our clock bias will be the same across all of them too. So this should do the trick. We now have four equations and four unknowns. A perfect solution to this system would satisfy all of the equations. That is, when we substitute values for lowercase x, y, z, and t into the left-hand sides, they'd all evaluate to zero. But will we be able to do that? We need to remember that our measurements are quite noisy, and we'll receive signals from closer satellites before ones that are further away. That means some measurements might be taken at different times. It seems unlikely that we'll be able to find a perfect solution. However, we can try to find the best solution we can by minimizing the error.
Before I talk about the technique we'll use to do that, let's explore a similar but simpler technique in 2D called the newton raphson method. Say we have a function f of x, and we want to find a value of x such that f of x equals 0. Geometrically, this is equivalent to finding a point where f of x touches the x-axis, shown here as a dotted line. The first step in the newton raphson method is to make an initial guess. Let's say it's on the right here. Next, you take the value or height of the function at that guess, divide it by the derivative or slope at the same point, and make a new guess by subtracting the result from the current guess. This is the same as calculating the x-coordinate at which the tangent to the function intersects the x-axis. And you can see that this has moved us closer to the zero. As we repeat this process, we get closer and closer and can stop when the guess effectively stops changing between iterations. Hopefully you can see how this helps us approximate the zero. The technique we'll use is called the Gauss-Newton algorithm and it's kind of like a generalization of the newton raphson method to multiple dimensions. I'll just give a high-level overview here because it's relatively complicated, but if you're interested, check out the Wikipedia page. This time, instead of trying to make one function of one variable equal to zero, we're trying to make our four or more pseudo-range equations, each of four variables equal to zero. That means our initial guess will contain four values, one for each variable. If we were to substitute this into the pseudo-range equations, it's unlikely they would evaluate to zero, but we want to change the guess in some way that moves them towards zero. In the 2D example, we used the derivative or slope of the function to do this. Here, we use the multi-dimensional equivalent, which is called the Jacobian matrix. Each row of the matrix corresponds to one of the pseudo-range equations. Each column corresponds to one of the variables, and each cell is the partial derivative of that pseudo-range equation with respect to that variable. In other words, each cell tells us how the result of that pseudo-range equation changes with that variable. Does it go up, down, or not change at all? We use this in the same way as the derivative to iteratively improve our guess. I've included the iteration equation here for completeness, but don't worry if you don't understand it. The takeaway is that we iteratively improve our guess, moving closer and closer to solving all of the pseudo-range equations each time. We probably won't solve them perfectly, but after enough iterations, we should have something that's pretty close. We have one last thing to do, which is to convert our final guess from ECEF coordinates to geodetic coordinates, so they're expressed as latitude, longitude, and height. We can do this with a technique called bow rings method. And with that, we've done it. We've gone from raw GPS signals to an estimate of our location. Let's recap the important points from this final video. First, we express locations using ECEF coordinates to simplify calculating distances. Second, the pseudo-range equation relates our distance to the satellite and the signal transit time. Third, the signal transit time is defined as the time we received a signal minus the time it was transmitted, where those times can be calculated in the ways we discussed. Fourth, the satellite's location can be calculated using the equations in the GPS spec. Fifth, we need a system of at least four pseudo-range equations to solve for our location and clock bias. That means we need data from at least four satellites. And finally, the Gauss-Newton algorithm is used to solve that system, giving us an estimate of our location and clock bias. Thanks so much for watching. If you've made it this far, you might also be interested to check out my implementation of a GPS receiver, which you can find on GitHub. I've left a link in the description. I'd also love to hear your feedback, questions, and thoughts in the comments so I can make my next videos even better.